My name is Sharon Coyle. I now teach with um, Performa, uh, the Master Teachers Program, the English side of um, the, the uh, University of Sherbrooke's uh, program, master's program for um, teaching at the college level. And one of the courses I teach is, is about techno pedagogy. And the other course that I teach is about um, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And that EDI course is a brand new course. It's been run once and we're in it again. And I see there's some of the people in this class or in this webinar today that are part of that um, class. And there's a new one in French too. And it's been run once in the fall. And I think it's running again right now or in the fall. Um, and if you're really interested in, in these ideas about equity, diversity, and inclusion, I highly recommend um, taking the, uh, the course. And that's where a lot of these ideas are, are coming from out of those readings and the experience of, of talking with teachers um, in the context of that course. Um, so I'm going to go to the next slide. So the plan for the webinar, uh, we're going to do a, a little EDI refresher. So just to make sure we're on the same page as far as the terminology goes. And then we're going to talk about technology. And my, my title for that section is why is my head spinning? Because there's a lot going on in technology right now, but especially AI and especially chat GPT. But there are lots of other um, tools like that that are that are, you know, changing the way things are happening in teaching and learning. Um, then I'm going to, we're going to talk more specifically about ChatGPT with some examples. I have basically two examples or three things I want to, sh to show you. Then we're going to talk about bias and in sources, including AI, with a couple of examples and then a, a quick wrap, wrap up. So what I prefer is just because there's so much to, to talk about, and then we have about 45 minutes or 50, no, 55 minutes, um, you can ask questions in the chat, and if they're not answered by the end of the webinar, if we have time, we can answer them there. And if not, we'll put them uh, in the community of practice on LinkedIn. It's called Supporting Source Savvy Students, and it's really dedicated to SAGEP teachers. Um, and, and everybody can try to help answer them, because I certainly don't have all the answers. So equity, diversity, inclusion. Quick overview. Equity is not the same thing as, as equality. A lot of the time, before we start diving into it, we, we mix those two up, so we think treating everybody the same is a good idea. And the metaphor that, that is often used is, you know, giving everybody the same style and and size of shoe doesn't work. And, you know, so so that's a good example of equality, but really what we need to do is equity and, and get people, probably not high heels because there's very few cases where that's really needed, but anyway, um, okay, diversity. So I, a really easy way to wrap your head around the concept of diversity is to think about, do the students in your program reflect the community you live in? And if the answer to that is yes, then you're probably doing pretty well in diversity. But diversity is really the first step. Once you get them into your program, how are you making sure that they're really part of what's going on and that they're that they're supported? Um, and 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 then um, sorry, yeah. And and so if there's no inclusion going on, then there's no perseverance it's 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 difficult for people to to to, to keep going and then the, uh, there's another word that's becoming really popular to add to those three letters edi and that's b for belonging so i think that's an easy thing to think about for our classrooms do do our students feel like they belong and if they do then then we're doing a good job of edi or edib um so when we're thinking about EDI, we're grappling with concepts uh, of e equity, diversity, and inclusion. We need to understand what we should and shouldn't do and helping uh, knowing why it's the right thing or the wrong thing to do helps us commit to those actions. So for example, um, microaggressions. When you don't, when you haven't read very much about it, it's hard to understand what they are. What is a microaggression and how do I how do I not do that? Um, but when you start reading examples, then you realize, oh, I do that too. And here's ways that why I shouldn't do it. And here's what I can do instead. Um, so, so diving into some of these readings um, really helps. And one of the ways to do that is to listen to people who have traditionally been marginalized, watch movies, read books, listen to podcasts, follow people on Instagram, um, witness their experiences, and start practicing new behaviors. And it's okay to start with small steps um and 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 just do it a little bit of it at a time um one of the first things we do in the edi course is 
we fill out for ourselves as teachers a social identity worksheet. And if you type social identity worksheet onto um, Google search, you will find a million examples of, of social identity worksheets. And pick one that seems appropriate for an adult and you do it for yourself. And you can even ask students to do it. It's not usually something that you get them to share with you because you don't want people to be put in situations where they're sharing information they don't want to. But it really helps you understand ideas about privilege and power and marginalization. And so that's the next thing that you can do with EDI to, to sort of raise your awareness. The first wheel on this slide is put out by the Canadian government. And the second one is also Canadian. And I'm not, it's, it's somebody's research uh, project, but, and they're very similar, but there's little things that are different. And I just ended up putting both of them on because I thought they might help. And it just, it just helps you think about where you are. And one of the things that comes out in a social identity wheel, um, that's the slide, the previous slide, is that it's not constant. So in one situation, you might be marginalized and because of, because of a certain aspect of your social identity. And then in an, another situation, it might actually put you in a posi position of privilege and power. Um, so an easy example of that is I grew up in Southern Ontario, where speaking English put me in a, in a position of a privilege and power. And then when I moved to Setzil, which is in regional northern, more, more, more northern Quebec, it put me in a position of marginalization. So, you know, the same social attribute um, was put me in a different position. So it's not the, the actual identities that are, although some are more, more um, connected with, with um, putting you in, in traditionally um, difficult situations when you're interacting with other people. But, so those are all good experiences to try and get yourself thinking about EDI. So when we grapple with EDI, and I love that word grapple, because it's not something you can just learn about and then you're done. It's an ongoing process. And you, one of the things you need to do as a teacher is think about who's in your class. Um, try to widen the circle for who's attracted to your discipline. You know, is it a traditionally male or traditionally female? And I sh even those gender terms are, are, are problematic. Um, and, and so how, what are you doing as a, as, a, as a program to think about who, who's getting in there? Um, and supporting diversity on an ongoing basis. So not just getting the diversity in and then not doing anything. You need to, you need to keep putting those supports in place. Um, and then consider feelings of belongings as crucial to thriving. And sources, which this webinar is about, that what, what material you're using in your classes and what material you're asking your students to go look for plays a really big role in this. What are they reading? What are you asking them to read? What are you getting them to think about? So my last little slide on this, this um, EDI refresher course is um, this quote from Maya Angelou. And I actually put this into every single slideshow that I use in my class. Do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. Um, it doesn't really, it's not really helpful to feel guilty. I mean, we can feel guilty about things because most of us as Sage of Teachers are in at least some kind of position of privilege and power because we've got education, we have jobs, we've got knowledge. Um, and, and so, it, you know, it's easy to sort of start to feel like, you know, what do I do? But and that's a that's actually a good thing. But instead, use use those feelings of guilt to to sort of push you into, you know, what how can I make this better for everyone? So now we're on to technology. So do you feel like something has shifted in your role as a teacher? And does digital technology play a part in that shift? And I don't know, maybe you could give a thumbs up or a, <laughs> if if that's true for you. Um, I'm not sure if in this version of um, Zoom you have access to that, but maybe you could even just write a comment in, in the chat or something, because I think a lot of people do. I think since um, we went online during COVID, a lot of people feel a little bit harried and not through their choice. You know, here I am, I signed up to teach and I'm in this situation where uh, I'm having to deal with all this technology and I don't really understand it and I don't really like it and I just want to go back. And I'm sorry to say that's probably not possible. Um, so part of the reason you're feeling that way is because there have been a lot of major shifts. So every 10 years, PC, the web, mobile app, and a AI more recently. This is a document, it's about 40 pages long, and it's put out from by a Quebec consortium of universities and, and businesses 
Um, and they put out this report called From Gutenberg to ChatGPT, The Challenge of the Digital University. And I think it's applicable to the SAGEP level as well. And um, in it, they go through, and it was written in French and translated to English. So it's available in both if, if people want to go and look at it. And it's in the, the, the sources. All of this will be available online, the PowerPoint and the, the references at the end. Um, and the 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 webinar itself is recorded and you can you can go back and look at it if you if you miss something if I go too fast. Um, so for thousands of years, knowledge like we share with our students at, at the SAGEP level was transferred mostly by speaking and then somewhat written. So you might have things written in caves or written on um, stone tablets and then maybe on papyrus and maybe on chalk. And, um, so, but for a, lot, a really long time, that was how we shared information about how to do things and watching other people by, by modeling and, and things like that. And then about 600 years ago, the printing press um, really made the transfer of, of information speed up and, and spread more rapidly and to more faster and to more people. So, you know, you could get your ideas out there and you could share information. And that was sort of where universities really began. And they began where, where the books were was was where you know you had the people who were interpreting them and sharing them with the students, but there might not be that many copies of books, but um, you know that was sort of more controlled and it was really the universities doing that. And then you get to digital information in the past 50 years and information is really pretty much accessible to everyone any, anywhere. Be, well, maybe not anywhere yet because you didn't have the internet. So 30 years ago, you get the internet coming on board. I don't know, you, you can probably tell this is exponential, right? It's getting shorter and shorter. And with the internet, then suddenly you didn't need to go to a university to find out all these things. You could find out information on the internet. And then AI changed things in a new way about 10 years ago. And then six months ago, chat GPT happened. So you can see these time periods are getting shorter and shorter. And so we're dealing with this tool that's only been there for about six months. Um, and so, you know, in red, it says knowledge. How do we create and share it? And how does this connect with college teaching? And I, I don't have exactly the answer to that, but I, that's what I want you to be thinking about. This is just, they're, they're not the same thing. So the first one talks about how the graph shows it took 20 years for 90% of the developed world to access the internet. And it took five days for 1 million users to start using ChatGPT. And now it's at, I don't even know how many million. So. Again, the speed and the uptake uh, and the that uh, you know how many people and how fast it's happening are just no wonder our heads are spinning. Um, it really has changed a lot and changed quickly. So this is from that thirty-page report. So here's and it's really long. So I was trying to just take snippets, and I know it's way too much text for, and I have several slides in this PowerPoint for that have way too much text, but. It was the best I could do. So the digital revolution will change the world of education. And this report was put out, you know, very recently, obviously, because it has chat GPT in it. Um, new skills that will be, will be required of the learner, the learner, the teacher, and the impact on the learning environment. Um, actually, and he's quoting um, this, this person that wrote this, wrote this even before COVID. So imagine how much more it's true now. So for the learner, it's gonna be necessary to know how to learn, to innovate. You have to have information technology skills. You need to um, be able to do critical thinking, problem solving and communication skills. You have to have some numeracy and yet you also still need some knowledge of, or excellent knowledge. It says uh, sciences, arts, humanities and philosophy. So that's for the, the learner, for the teacher, and we've all heard this already. It's going to be modified from that old, I know all this stuff and I'm telling you to the guide on the side. So um, where you're facilitating the knowledge and, and helping people learn how to go find it. This, the changes imposed on both the learner and the teacher will result in many transitions in, teach, in the teaching environment. Um, so that same person, Sakili, identifies five transitions. And he's in each of these, in, in the longer text, he's saying from, from standardized learning to individualized learning, from standardized assessment to specialized assessment, from having a head filled with knowledge to having a head that knows where to find knowledge. And um, it's focused on developing skills to access the mo most current knowledge, to ensure its currency and veracity, 
while knowing how to learn it. So that really, since this community of practice and this webinar is thinking about sources, that's really key to what we're thinking about today and the learning by model experience. This is a little bit outside of what we're talking about today, but I highly recommend reading that report. And in it, they imagine a, a Quebec University of the future and um, how it's really connected with technology. And it's really clear in that imagined scenario that tools like ChatGPT, um, we need to, to make them allies um, in the current and continuous academic training. There's a, there's there are two Facebook groups that I belong to about chat GP, teachers and chat GPT and in the English the, the French one is really really fabulous the English one sometimes gets a little bit um, people are arguing a little bit more and somebody wrote um, I wish there were two chat, uh, um, Facebook groups one that was for people who didn't want to use it and one for people that did but my sense of things is that's a bit futile because even if you don't want to use it, it's, it's, it's become part of our world. And it's a bit like denying climate change. It's still there, even if you don't accept it. And, and the image that came to my head was like owning a horse ranch beside Henry Ford's car plant. And I agree, the horse plant looks so much nicer, but we're in the car plant. And, and so we need to, we need to just learn to cope. And, and, and yeah, there's sort of no going back to the ranch, sadly. Um, so before we go more into the potential of AI, just a few reminders of why it's problematic. And um, when I was a young person back in university, I worked summers in, um, no, I think it was even still in high school, in, a, on, um, in an apple orchard. And they had this really cool machine for sorting apples. It was two long boards and the apples would roll along the crack that got wider and wider. So the smaller ones would fall through first and the the middle ones would fall through next, and then the larger ones would fall through next. So when we see the results of what ChatGPT can write for us, we it's easy to get fooled into thinking that there's some sort of cognition or thinking going on back there, but it's not. It's really that apple trough. It's really just dropping words in where they fit. So it looks at lots and lots and lots of, and it uses, instead of just one apple, it uses strings of words. Um, and, and so it can sort of see, well, in the past, these all fit together. So this is probably what's going to be there. So you just really need to be careful because there's no thinking about whether the apple is bruised or diseased. It just mechanically sorts by size, all right? So it doesn't, it doesn't know that the information that it has is, is true or not true. It's just saying, this fits here. Um, yeah, I'm looking at my notes to make sure I'm saying almost everything. Um, yeah, and, and just, you know, um, uh, uh, is it, uh, shared. yeah, oh yeah, that there was a pedagog, uh, there was a, I think it was a ped counselor at, at University of Sherbrooke, or sorry, Seja de Sherbrooke, that, um, looked at how much students were, actually using chat GPT and it was less than a lot of us are thinking. So that's something to think about too. Uh, these are three drawings from the first uh, or the second webinar that the first one about chat GPT that if you haven't looked at it, it gives a really good overview about chat GPT for SageUp teachers. And in it, um, I asked chat GPT for a metaphor comparing Wikipedia, Google search and um, chat GPT and it, it said that Wikipedia was like a, a trusty old librarian that knew where every book in the library was and Google search was like a magic librarian with a, mag a super librarian with a magic wand that could go get you know information from anywhere in the world and chat GPT was a witty storyteller and and the next slide said what's wrong with a witty storyteller and the problem is that you know it tells a really good story but you have to verify everything. It really doesn't know for sure that the information that it's giving you is right. And if you haven't heard the term stochastic, um, that's from a research paper too uh, that I talk about in the in that second webinar, or the first one about AI. Um, and basically the way large language models work is by probability. So there, 
there's the probability that this word is going to follow the or these words are going to follow this word. And so the term that that she comes up with as a researcher is stochastic Barrett. So they're just parroting back the information that we give them. But there's no thinking going on. And the other thing I, I said about ChatGPT is it's a bit like a like a golden retriever that it really wants to do what you want, what you ask it to do. But it's, you know, that imperative is comes over and above being right. So it will answer you, even if it doesn't know the answer, it will try to write, write the right answer. And that's getting a little better as time goes on because it's a, it's a learning machine. So it, it does, it does get better. Um, I have a whole lot of stuff on this slide, but I think I'm going to keep going because we, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I guess I've got one last thing that I'd just like to say. So when we're thinking about AI, one of the things we can do as teachers is think about what skills can we support that can't be du duplicated by AI? And, and two of them are voice and original thinking. I'm not sure this is exactly where I should be saying that, but that's what I have in my notes here. So I'll say that. Um, so AI detectors are not the solution. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to be at the bearer of bad news. I, I, and lots of people, this was their question when you when you were offered a, the chance to voice a question and when you signed up for this research, um, how reliable are the detectors? Everything I've read, all the experts are saying, don't use them, don't believe them. You can get positive, false positives and false negatives. It's always going to be, you're going to be one step behind um, the technology Never ask a never ask chat GPT if it was written by this. It doesn't know. It's not a thinking machine. It's a it's a machine that shakes up words in a cup and pours them out to you. Um, so it doesn't it has no idea if it wrote something or not. Um, so, yeah. And the other thing I was thinking about is think about what we ask students to do in an essay. Right. We ask them to look at a whole lot of sources and then put it into their own words. What does Chad GPT, GPT do? It looks at a whole lot of sources and puts it into its own words. And it's very good at putting, that's why it looks so great because it's super good at syntax and everything. So, you know, those red flags about, you know, this looks like AI. Well, it also just really looks like student writing. It's got a lot of formulaic writing, you know, first, second, third, firstly, secondly, thirdly, and then it always ends in conclusion. And so do my students' essays a lot of the time. So if they are both looking like that, how is it supposed to flag? And I know that there are tools out there that you can buy, but yeah, everything I'm reading is don't do that. And it also puts us into a very awkward role with our students. So do you really want to go there? And my answer would be no. I don't think that's a good a good direction. So we're moving on to some examples of how tools like ChatGPT can be made into an ally. Since you know we would like to say don't use it, but it's going to be used. So um, here are three thoughts about that. So I've got one from a student, one from a teacher who's here in the workshop, and uh, several pages from me because I used it I used I told, asked my students to use ChatGPT in the EDI course this winter. Um, so you want to help students to use it effectively and with guardrails. So this is from an article and it's listed in the in the um, references. So a student says rather than fully embracing AI as a writing assistant, the reasonable conclusion is that there needs to be a split between assignments on which using AI is encouraged and assignments on which using AI can't possibly help. So that's kind of a, a nice way for as teachers to think, okay, so there are some, I can say, use it for this, but for this, we're gonna do it in class or it's gonna be some other format where it's not going to, it's not, it's not gonna be useful to use this tool. So colleges ought to prepare their students for the future and AI literacy will certainly be important in, in our students' futures. But AI isn't everything, and if education systems are to continue teaching students on how to think, they need to move away from the take-home essay as a means of doing this and move on to AI-proof assignments like oral exams, in-class writing, or some new style of schoolwork better suited to the world of artificial intelligence. I wish I knew exactly what that was. I don't, but I'm starting to get an idea. And, you know, we've all been thrown into this world-sized experiment without an instruction booklet. And so you know, we all have to kind of figure figure it out as we go along. We have literally come, become the guide on the side when it comes to AI, because we can't know more than our students. We probably know about as much and maybe even less. 
And so it's really a case of a, a community of inquiry, learning together. What is this tool? How is it changing what we do? How do we best use it? How do we avoid the pitfalls? So this is from Andrew Burton, who's a prophet Marianopolis, who's here in the webinar today. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and it, this is just an excerpt from instructions that he gave to students. And his article is also referenced, and you can read the whole thing, and it's very clear. Um, it's an online article that you can access very easily. Um, so when it comes to citing ChatGPT, he chose not to include it in the works cited list or credit the uh, AI as a co-author. Instead, Andrew asked students to describe their use of ChatGPT or any other forms of support in a dedicated support section. So he, he got them thinking about academic in integrity and he said, collaborating with others and using tools can be eth ethically legitimate. And those are important skills. So in this assignment, specifically, you can seek assistance from others. And he gives examples, including parents or grammar checkers or AI chat box bots. And, but they, they needed to provide an account of how they use that on a separate page. Um, and so what he, in his, in his explanation of how to do that, he said, you have to have a page after your work cited that's called support that describes any assistance you received from chat GPT or from your mother <laughs> um, and you have to name them and what type of assistance you got in the process and in the final version um, how, the, how the final version of your work of your essay um, reflects that so this is a really good example of how you could you could do that in your course um, so the next several slides and I'm, there's way too much text I know on these slides this is really not um, no, no feng shui at all, <laughs> um, but uh, I'm just trying to, you don't have to read all this and it's available online, um, but I'm trying to show you how I talked to the teachers, Sage Up teachers who were in my Performa class, um, my EDI class, how they could use EDI and why I was asking them. So I basically said it was encouraged for the course and I explained why. As college teachers, we need to understand what these tools like AI can do and how our students might be using them. And one way to learn more about them is to try to use them ourselves in similar circumstances to those our students experience. So as a student, um, also the fact that AI use is probably going to be pretty much everywhere. And so then do we not have a responsibility to help our students acquire the skills needed to use these tools effectively and ethically? This is still, my AI policy is like three pages long. It's crazy, <laughs> but but this is what I needed to do to make it clear. And I what I did was sort of gather things from other people that I was finding online, and then I putting it in what I needed for me and for my specific case. Um, so what I did, I gave teachers, a, a, the ch choice the teachers who are my students, um, of using AI a lot, somewhat or not at all. So... And, and then I described what those could be, you know, not at all, you don't have to. Um, if you didn't want to sign up for ChatGPT, but you're kind of curious, I for each journal, I made a doc um, with examples of um, prompts and responses, and I, I made them specific. So it might be, you know, the, the journal prompt for a phys ed teacher in Montreal, or the journal prompt for a nursing teacher in um, Heritage College, or, you know, so, so that they were um, they could see how you get different results depending on what you're asking. Um, and for the people that really want to play with the bot, you know, I, uh, I said, yeah, use it, but just make sure at the end that you include uh, in some explanation of how you used it. So a little bit like Andrew, it wasn't included, but in the, in the references, but it was, you know, just, they still had to say how they were using it. Um, and this was my ethical and practical guardrail. So um, how you could use it to create an outline or to help with drafts or to refine and edit. I had several teachers who were francophone taking an English language, a course in English. And so writing for them was, was more problematic for, than perhaps for their um, Anglophone uh, colleagues. And so this is where EDI comes in. This is kind of an, a nice equalizer because you can take your, your journal and, and then run it through and ask for um, advice on syntax and grammar and, and, and it, will, it will provide you that. Um, and so it made people feel more confident and, and it was a tool to learn. If you think about what we do as teachers, 
that's kind of what we do, right? We take the time to read through student work and say, you know, well, you could say this like this and you're, you're, you're missing something here. And so we're sort of outsourcing that. And then it gives us more time to work on other things, other things that the, the AI, AI can't do. Um, and also the reminder that you have to fact check everything because AI hallucinates. Um, yeah. Let me see if there's anything I'm missing here. I think we're okay. Uh, and we're almost at the end of the AI policy. So I also included things that were unacceptable. And this is, I think, our, all of us as stage of teachers, this is kind of our teaching nightmare. Um, our students just going to take the essay question I give them, plug it into chat GPT, and then give me the answer. And the answer to that is probably yes, unless you build in functionalities in your assessment, things like, I want you to hand in an outline and I want you to explain why you did it like that, or I want you to hand in several steps. Um, that that will be a way to make sure that you your students, they might still be using ChatGPT to help them, but it wouldn't be able to do it all because of the steps. Um, it's talking about the responsibility as a learner and our responsibility as instructors, because this is the class for stage of teachers, is to learn to teach in this new reality by creating assignments that only human students can complete, even if student effort is improved by AI. So I think we need to kind of get, as, as stage of teachers, we need to get our head around that idea that it's okay for the AI to help students get a better mark, instead of thinking, oh, it just shouldn't be there. The same way we do for calculators and grammar check. We've now that's become okay. And I think give it not very long, I'm gonna say two years, and we're gonna feel the same way about AI. It's just gonna be another tool in students um, toolkit. Uh, and yeah, so for this particular course that I was doing with the students, I wanted them to think of our course as a laboratory for exploring um, this to new tool together. Um, and these were examples of ethical disclaimers that I found and ways to cite it um, that I found online. And there are also now MLA and APA both have um, methods. So you can find those online and these links are, are there in the PowerPoint. Um, so, so there's really not a problem you, there for, for you or for your students to know how to cite um, um, chat GPT or AI in general. This is again, just from my EDI course. So this is what my Moodle page looked like. It's just a screenshot. Um, and so I just, again, gave them, you know, here's some, uh, if you don't click on this doc, if you don't want to see examples, some people don't want to see it because it interferes with their original thinking. So don't don't go there. But if you do, here's the here's the doc, and here are some of the ways you can use it. After I finished the course, I did a little quiz and I asked students several questions about the course in general, but I also asked about ChatGPT. So I asked them, "Will you keep using it?" Or sorry, "Did you use it for the course?" And you can see that. Uh, you know, some people did, not everybody. I'll keep using it in the futures. Again, some in a bit. Um, I'll discuss AI with my students. Again, this was pretty mixed. Yes, for, for there were 22 people in the class and I think 20 something filled this, this in, um, but a little more reluctance there. Um, I will allow my students to use AI with grad, grad guardrails. And again, only like one person said yes and a few people said maybe. So people are still, not feeling confident and comfortable with this, and understandably. And then the last two were, were pretty interesting to me. I'm glad I had the chance to learn more about ChatGPT. So almost everybody said yes or a bit. And um, I feel more comfortable knowing more about AI and ways to address uh, its use in teaching and learning. And almost everybody said yes or a bit in that. So I think that's one of the things you're doing. You're here in this workshop today because you want to understand more about what this is and how it works. So that's a really good start. I also really recommend trying it. Go and try it. Feed your prompts into it, but also use it for your life. You know, um, if you're doing a renovation, ask for ideas for a renovation. If you're looking for a good um, recipe of a certain type, ask it for a recipe. And, and it's good to do things that you know about so you can judge whether it's valid or not. Um, and even do it, ask it to do creative things. I love asking it to give me metaphors or several metaphors for the same process. Um, it can also do tables, so you can ask it to put the information into a table and, and see how it looks there. So here are some comments from, from the stage of teachers who were in my EDI class uh, about using ChatGPT, and I'm not, I'm gonna, this is going to be available online that you can look at later, but 
I love the one that's highlighted there. It certainly highlights the reason why we need to stay on top of this because it's here and it will be more prevalent in the future. And, and you know, uh, somebody who's francophone, I found it helpful to use ChatGPT to improve my syntax grammar and the formulation of my moon in that analogy. So that was cool. Um, uh, you know, different topics in their field of uh, practice. It was fun, but also kind of scary. Um, it helped me to understand how it can be used as a tool, but also how my students may or may not be using it. And also getting ideas and organizing thoughts. So this is a chance for you to be active in the chat again. So can AI be used to support universal design for learning by helping to level the playing field for students with learning difficulties or in other situations? And I would say, I think yes, I think it can be. So you can use ChatGPT to help with syntax and grammar for students with learning disabilities or when the language of instruction is less familiar. You could use it um, to help someone with great ideas organize and structure their message so their voice can be heard. You've probably all have had that student in your class who has great ideas but who has trouble writing. So this is a tool they can use to, to get their ideas down on paper. And isn't that wonderful? To me, that's, that's a really cool thing. And it can also help somebody who lacks ideas but writes really way really well to generate ideas. So again, you're you're providing possibility for for equity. Um, teachers can easily prepare monthly level examples and texts and assessments um, with ChatGPT. Talk to join join those Facebook groups in English or in French for teachers and ChatGPT. And there's tons and tons of ideas going by every day of how teachers are using this uh, with their students. And, and it's, it's, it's pretty fabulous. And I would say one of the big things that I'm seeing is how much time it's saving people. It's, it's, it's saving them time on creating learning activities so that they can focus more on you know, making new ones or making better ones. So they're not just struggling to just get the one thing done. Um, teachers can use ChatGPT to find suggestions to support specific learners too. Obviously you need to check things, but it, it it's like Google search on speed. It, it's, it's, it's looking through tons and tons and tons of articles and, and, and putting that information together and offering it up to you. It can be wrong, but a lot of the time for, for, for things where the information is pretty solid out there, it can, it can be really helpful. So if you have other ideas, add them in the chat for other people to see. So uh, now we're moving on to more sources specific. So in a world where information is global because of the internet and there's great diversity in populations, we have access to a wide range of ideas and the driving need to be conscious of who is in our class and who our students will, will interact with in the future. And for me in the EDI course, that really came up a lot of the time with nurses because it's so, you know, we don't often think about who our students in, a, in an English class who they're gonna be interacting with about literature in the future. But in nursing, it's very clear that connection of, I support my students and they're learning how to be uh, with other people. And then they are directly interacting with other people in ways that, that needs to be appropriate. Um, and, and so that EDI course really becomes uh, important not just for what's happening in your classroom but then what happens after when they go out into the world or into their into into their roles um, in what they've learned so let's consider sources including AI with equity diversity and inclusion in mind and Willie this shout out to you this it's you that found that nice uh, nice uh, graphic uh, diversity is a fact equity is a choice inclusion is an action and belonging is an outcome it's really well said and that's shared all over the place on on social media, I couldn't find a source for it besides Arthur Chan, uh, who's written in the, in the picture. So bias in AI and other sources, it's really hard to see bias when it aligns with our perspectives. And I think that's, you know, that's pretty obvious. We often think of bias in terms of binaries, good, bad, liberal, conservative, reliable, unreliable, but bias can be much more subtle than that. So here are two examples. Um, that should say one, not on. Sorry, that's a, a, a typo I just noticed. Uh, one from uh, sources in general and one from AI. So if you're in psychology, you probably already know this example. So weird people. Um, I am a weird person. So 
three scientists from the University of British Columbia sort of rocked the psychology world. They published a 23-page paper called The Weirdest People in the World. Um, and what they found, and it, if you look at the graphic on the, on the, the left, publications, 96% of the publications were about 12% of the world's population. And yet we were generalizing from these studies saying that this is how people are. This is human nature. But when they did studies on indigenous populations, they found that there was much more consistency across groups than that big group of people that most of the studies are done on didn't apply to other groups very well. So that's a really good example of a, of a problem with sources and bias and EDI, why you need to look outside of your group. Um, so yeah, people from Western society, including young children are among the least representative populations one could find for generalizing about humans. And they call their culture weird for Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic societies. Um, and in that article that's, that's um, in the references, they were specifically talking about um, motherhood and they were looking at um, Mayan mothers and comparing them to American mothers and how um, the Mayan mothers weren't stressed and they were really outsourcing a lot of the, the child rearing events to the community, to friends and, and relatives and, and siblings. And, and so, and, and, and it, there was sort of a, a bigger, broader um, field of operation for, for parenting going on, as opposed to the American version of what they called the mother in the box. Um, where you have one mom and one kid and you sort of isolated them from everything. So that's just a really good example of a problem with our sources. And why would you, why is that important? So it says widening the parenting lens, even just a smidgen has a practical purpose. It gives parents options. And when you look at the whole world and see the diversity out there, parents can start to imagine other ways of doing things. So I think that's a really good example of um, uh, diversity and sources. Uh, so another example of bias, um, AI and the American smile. And this article is referenced in, in the references again. Um, imagine a time, so this is a thread on um, mid, mid journey or something. Imagine a time travel or journey to various times and places throughout human history and showed soldiers and warriors of the periods what a selfie is. And so, these are um, AI generated images of warriors from different time periods taking a selfie. And it says like other AI hallucinations, that's the term they, they make up for um, that when, when AI just sort of thinks, well, this sounds like it's good and it gives you something, but it's not even a real thing. It, it can make up articles, it can make up authors, it can make up things like this. So these algorithm extrusions, I like that word, were, were made, I'm telling a made up stories. And basically, what the article talks about is that people don't smile like this. People didn't smile like this in these time periods. This is a really, this is an American phenomena, this, this big grin. And then they talk about smiling, you know, people who grew up in cultures where there's, you know, a, a low levels of uncertainty avoidance. Um, so like how much you engage with norms and traditions, we're more likely to believe that smiling faces looked unintelligent. Um, and so they think it's inadvisable. And in fact, they don't trust a politician who's smiling because he looks like he's lying or hiding something. So in North America, we tend to think, oh, this looks nice, but, but somebody else doesn't have that same. So the problem with that is that the AI is making this up. This is not how it would look. And in fact, if you go back to real images from different time periods, um, they don't look like that at all. People are not smiling like that. So every American knows how to say cheese when taking a photo. So, so does the AI when generating new image based on patterns established by the previous ones, but it wasn't always like that. This And what's the problem with this? In flattening the diversity of facial expressions of civilizations around the world, AI had collapsed the spectrum of history, culture, photography, and emotions into a singular monolithic perspective. It presented a false visual narrative about the universality of something that in the real world, where real humans have lived and created culture, expression, and meaning for hundreds of thousands of years is anything but uniform. So I think that's another really good example of why we need to look at sources and go beyond, especially North America. 
So another way we can improve EDI is that we can look at the types of resources that we're using. And this really fits with universal design for learning. So, you know, peer reviewed articles are the gold standards, but who, whose voices are left out? So you can consider alternative sources, TED Talks, podcasts, blogs, Instagram. Um, I'm sure there's other things, but um, that's just to get you thinking. And this is a really great article. To, it's a decision-making tool. It's a bunch of questions under the, 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 the letters V-I-B-E, Vibe, for short. So it's about views, inclusion, benefits, and burdens. And anytime you make a decision, so including, do I use this source? You can ask yourself these questions. And it can be for other things like, do I give a makeup test? Or, um, you know, what should my course outlook look, line look like? So whose view is centered? Whose view is not being considered? Um, whose voice has been included thus far? Who should be? Who should be consulted in order to understand the implications of this decision? And so on. Who will benefit? Um, will this decision ultimately lead to a more equitable environment? So you're always thinking about, um, you know, when you choose your sources, what's going to be the effect on the students and, and, and the future. So this is the last slide. We've actually done really well. We've zoomed through this, so we will probably have some time for, for questions. Um, the last thing I want you to do, this is the last slide of content, and there's a couple uh, uh, housekeeping things. Um, what is the canon in your discipline? So in literature, anybody who teaches literature, English literature knows that term, the literary canon, and it's the, the books that are and short stories and novels and plays that are decided on sort of generally by the, the people who are teaching these courses that they should be included in what students are learning. And in the past 30 to 50 years, I think it's been much broadened to include voices. Um, in the past, it was mostly white dead guys from Europe is what a lot of people say. And, and then it, now it's become, you know, you have writers from Africa and South America and, um, from from different genders and 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 different socioeconomic uh, perspectives, um, and and that really helps. So how do you do that in nursing or in dental hygienists? Uh, you know what? How do you how do you open up your canon? And I don't have the answers for everybody, but this is a really good place to start. And I can I can give you two quick examples. Um, one was one is about dentures. So in my EDI class, I had a, a, a guy um, who who was in the denture taught denturology, I think it's called, how to make dentures. And he said, well, in North America, we start, and now I can't remember if it's the top or the bottom, but one or the other. And in Europe, they start with the opposite. So in North America, we start with the top, and in Europe, they start with the bottom. And I don't have time to teach, because it takes a long time to teach students how to do that, but I can at least say and show them that you know that it's not everywhere this way. So that's a, that I thought was a really good example of opening up the canon for EDI. Um, another uh, example was in nursing. Uh, they talked about, um, and this isn't exactly in choosing sources, but it, it is still when you're when you're making case studies. What names are you choosing? What what communities are they reflecting? There's something simple like that you can start with. And another one that that comes to mind is when I was. When I was a young mother and I was looking at books for feeding a baby, I, I grabbed a book off the shelf in, in the Setsil Library, public library that was from France. And babies, instead of starting at cereal, which is what in North America, where you know, after they finish nursing or, or having milk from the bottle, they 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 go with they start with cereal. That's that's just what it is. And in, in France, they started with a vegetable broth. And I was blown away because I was like, what? And so you know, what is it like in your discipline? What are what are the blind spots that we haven't seen and that your students don't get access to because we didn't think to to open up the to broaden our canon? So that's that's the the last thing. And uh, then uh, I would like to because I know we're at yeah we have like nine minutes left. So this work this webinar um, I'd like to thank uh, University of Sherbrooke. And uh, enseignement, uh, education et enseignement supérieur, the ministre d'éducation. Um, it was developed uh, for Performa at the University of Sherbrooke with a grant from the Ministère de l'Enseignement supérieur. And special thanks to Soissons Laco and Dominique Briard and Laura Lee Bouchard um, for steering the project. And that image that you see there is the Quebec Digital Competency Framework. And it's a beautiful thing. The documents are online in English and in French. Um, and 
it's a really good place to go to start thinking about how am I supporting my students um, in this, this new world. Um, I should say community of practice. It's missing a C in that that I just noticed that. Um, but yeah, join the community practice on, on LinkedIn. Somebody could put that in the chat maybe. Um, and, and that's a place where you can ask more questions uh, about this. And this is the link for the workshop evaluation. So if you use your phone or you can, maybe somebody could put the link uh, in the chat too. Um, that's available. And then the last, very last slide just has um, references. So yeah, and I will uh, stop sharing. And if people want to turn on cameras and talk and ask questions, that would be great. Andrew, did you want to say anything? I, did I represent clearly your, your, your activity with your students? I think you did, Sharon. You, you know, touched on the specific aspects of citation I played with. Uh, something that's going to be controversial at one of at my department's meeting in about three days, four days, is the inclusion of words from ChatGPT that are not in quotation marks. And I think some people feel that's a kind of moral imperative to yeah. always designate those words in quotation marks. What I'm planning to argue is that's actually just a practice. And where it becomes immoral is if the teacher set the expectation that you would do so. But when I did my assignment, I said, that's not the expectation. You do have to do that with the words from the text, but not with this. So yeah. I do see a way to that, where that can be ethical, but we'll have that debate and we'll see what people think. That's a really good point, Andrew. And honestly, I hadn't even thought about it yet. <laughs> even though I've been thinking about this a lot over the last uh, few months. Yeah. Uh, how do you... Are you are you obliged to make it clear which bits are from because it ends up sort of, you know, you, you can use that, but your your thinking is going into the prompt. So it kind of is yours. You kind of own it in some ways. So it's really it's it's hard. It's a it's a, it's it gets blurry. It, it's blurring all our understandings of how these things work. Well, it certainly challenges like an MLA or APA or very standard academic mode of citation. Those yeah. have their rationale and they're great tools. I would just say they're tools and we use them when they make sense. And yeah. if the premise is that AI will be a kind of co-author, then they don't make sense. Yeah. So I think I think we can make that distinction. But yeah. again, not everyone may agree with that. Yeah. And, and it may take time too for people to come on board because I still think a lot of people are, and, and I mean, I almost wish we could like show hands or whatever are in the mode, like make it go away. <laughs> And, and, and I, I understand that, but I just, it's, it's, I don't think it's going to. And so I think, you know, people like you who are sort of in the avant-garde of, of, of how do we do this? How do we, you know, what are some ways that we can, we can work with our students to, because, and in the working world, everything that I'm hearing from everybody is that they're, they're using this. So, so, you know, are we really not going to, are we going to hide this from our students? Like, you know, and, and anyway, how could we, like, it just, it, it, it's, it's a puzzling thing. Anybody else have other comments? Uh, Jane. It's, I'm so grateful that you put this together and that you offered it to us because I have been grappling and I have been like resisting. Yeah. <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> uh, but I have been noticing students using it and students using it, not knowing how to use it and inevitably actually failing some assignments because the way they used it didn't fulfill the requirements of the assignment. So yeah. it's kind of like our responsibility to show them well, this is how and where and when it's appropriate. And this is what it won't do for you. So yes, that, yeah, you know, it does all of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good, really good point. Thanks, Jane. Yeah. yeah. Do we have anybody else that has any thoughts or questions? And I don't know if there's any, yeah, go ahead, Andrew. And I don't know if there's any in the chat. Maybe Dominic, you can tell me if there's anything that somebody said. I'll just say to Jane, if you look at that uh, adjective article that I put in the chat, in there is the uh, how to use ChatGPT for writing a literary essay guide that I gave to my arts and science students and liberal arts students. And so it begins by explaining, as Sharon did, what the limits are, but then what are some specific use cases. So you might find that interesting. 
Yeah, that's really helpful. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, your your article is very thorough, and you had lots of links to, to interesting things. And and again, I can't you know join join communities of practice, including ours, but also the the ones on Facebook for for ChatGPT. And I think that really that really will help um, get more examples because we we want to hear what other teachers are doing. So there are people, and they're spending a lot of time on this. So you know why not benefit from what they're learning. <laughs> I like that. I figured out how to use cell phones. I sometimes feel like that too. <laughs> a minute before this thing started, Dominic was helping me uh, figure out how to get what right screen on the right uh, right monitor. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, and all of the video and the references and everything. Yeah, Lorian is is putting that in the chat. Will all be available on the Performer website uh, pretty shortly. Amy has a question. Yeah, good. Amy, go ahead. We're not hearing you. How's your mic going? Huh. I see that you have no camera, but it seems like it's not the mic isn't picking us up. Do you, do you want to write something in the com in the chat? Uh, and uh, maybe while you're trying to figure that out, yeah. Okay, great, Amy. Uh, Ali, go ahead. Oh, thank you, Sharon, for this wonderful presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, I just thought we need more of these uh, presentations to share our ideas. I, I sent a couple of questions, I mean, you when uh, I registered for the uh, for the webinar. I saw uh, that. Uh, OK, thank you. But uh, I want to add, I mean, just uh, maybe I, I have this feeling that maybe we are making uh, thoughts or maybe decisions that may be too premature. We have been taken off guard by uh, ChatGPT and all the uh, our thoughts right now are based on the uh, what we have known so far. That is the the the, uh, the conventional paradigms in terms of uh, education, uh, educational uh, thought, educational thinking, and uh, one of the things that I noticed just uh, not just in this webinar but in an, uh, in others uh, is the, the focus is on texts, on writing. On uh, and which moves quickly to plagiarism and uh, uh, the, the, this adversarial attitude towards ChatGPT and towards uh, students, whereas uh, ChatGPT is a very, very, very intrusive technology. We don't know yet what the impact will be, even between now and September. It's right. it's moving very, very, very fast. Very fast. And yeah. I, I think it's. <laughs> It's, it, it's provocative and it's inviting us to uh, maybe a radical reinvention of ourselves, of our, uh, our uh, ministry, uh, I mean, our, I mean uh, literally really everything, right. literally everything. So uh, probably the first step in my view is to try and to stay away, to try and to stay away from our conventional uh, springboards the text the 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 uh, the the, the, uh, the the questioning of students uh, ability to write or not to write so all of those uh, keeping in mind that the chat gpt is a multimodal uh, ai so it's it's giving us uh, image sound uh, etc etc and now that's the world we will live in yeah. And that's the world our students will live in. So those who say, oh, no, no there's no, uh, and I don't want uh, chat GPT, they, they are, uh, I mean, out of history. They are uh, just walking, uh, I mean, behind history. The future is teaching our students how to live their almost uh, science fiction reality. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ali. Yeah, I, and I agree. We're going really fast, and I, I know one of your other questions in the in the chat was like, "Who's who's teaching the teachers about this?" And I mean, this is kind of what you get. The and and I think I think teachers in Performa will be trying to do this kind of thing. The ones that are comfortable with it, they will be, you know, providing opportunities for for teachers to learn more to to to, uh, to because you know we're kind of thrown into this and and. 
Yes, I think one way is to avoid traditional take home essays for sure that's that is probably a, you know one 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 way but uh, yeah, how can we include it too Amy. And thank, Hi, thank you. People, sorry, I mean, just before you go, I know some people have to leave and I mm -hmm. would see some thank yous and, uh, and uh, thanks, thanks everybody for being here. And uh, I, I really, I really enjoyed it. Go ahead, Amy. I'll be quick because I'm cognizant of the time. Um, I'm biased, first of all, so I'll state that at the beginning because I am the librarian at uh, Marianopolis with Matthew, who is here as well. Um, I want to say quickly, um, perhaps on behalf of your libraries at your individual schools, that your librarians can be very good partners in yeah. some of the work that has to be done both by you as the teachers, um, but also for your students. I hear a lot of echoes of conversations that we were having 20 years ago when the internet was just coming out onto the, the, the scene and, uh, a lot of the concerns that we had then, they sound very similar to me when we talk about the AI generators. Um, in particular for your librarians, I think um, we're good at helping people learn how to be selective about the sources that they, they choose to use, um, learning how to discern, again, what is an authoritative uh, site or source. Also, of course, you've talked about citation, but the citation is where we excel. That's definitely our number one question here at Marianopolis. And um, I think I do, I just, I think there is a role for librarians to be embedded or integrated into a lot of these conversations. So I, I would uh, invite you to reach out to us. Thanks. Thank That's you. Such an important piece, Amy. And, and actually, in the second webinar, you guys were featured really. Um, prominently uh, librarians in your sage up and really mm -hmm. that's the best place to, to go to get support for 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 sources uh, so yes thank you thank you and I'm sorry I didn't mention it earlier <laughs> that was a that was an oversight on my part <laughs> uh, thanks well I think we're I think we're done thanks so much to everybody it's really fun to to see this many people that are interested in uh, you know, thinking about these things and, and it's good to get together and sorry, it's mostly just me talking, but yeah, that's kind of how a webinar has to go. <laughs> so um, yeah, Dominic, did you need to say anything or to finish up? We're good. No, well, thanks to you, Sharon. It was the last, it was the last webinar of the series, yes. everybody. So we are very, very happy about this uh, series and the project in, it, in itself. If you want to continue the conversation, you're more than welcome to do so in the community of practice. You'll find all the links uh, to the web, Trump web evaluation and the community of practice on our website. Please uh, look out for your emails. Thank you very much for being uh, part of this. It was lovely to see you all, really, really. Yeah. And lovely to work with you, Sharon, and with you as well, Laura Lee. I know your camera's not on, but still, I'll say it. <laughs>